I'm Jay Hoekstra, and I'm on the board of the Michigan chapter of the Congress for New Urbanism. And, um, but there are 18 people here who have registered and paid to attend this conference, and thank you very much for doing so. It's very unusual, I think, that people would pay money to find out about sewage treatment. <laughs> and, uh, but, uh, yeah, I, I think it was just, I went to Pine Graduate School, I think it was covered just briefly in one course, and I thought this is really boring stuff. And then I went to planning at a city and county and found out it was one of the most important things there is, and there were big political battles about the location of power lines. So I see from the list that there are eight people here from Empire. Do you want to raise your hands? So are you local officials? Uh, I know two or three people here, including me, are residents of the new neighborhood, my neighbors over there. Are there other of local officials from Empire? Village Council. Village Council? Village Council. Oh, great. Thank you. Nice to meet you. Thank you. I'm one of your residents. And uh, there's some other people here. There's some people from nearby, like uh, um, Maple City, somebody from Maple City, and from Alberta, and uh, let's see, Beulah, somebody from Beulah. So what is your interest? Pardon? What, is, what are your both interests in this? Your citizens? I was an architect and also on the planning commission in Alberta. Okay, great. And uh, also the Frankfurt Area Housing Commission. Oh, wow, great. So, and there are a few other people. Um, so that's who you are. And who, uh, who are we? I'll get to in a minute. Um, there is another architect coming in a minute. Um, so why are we here? Uh, it started because uh, Robert was complaining about all the people that were calling him and asking him lots of questions about the neighborhood, and he was getting tired of that. He said, why don't you have a conference so I can get everybody together at the same time and get this over with? And I said, yes, that was two years ago. COVID happened. But we're finally getting to it. So that's one reason. The other reason is that this is put on by the Michigan chapter for the Congress for the New Urbanism. And that is explained a bit over there, it was started um, about 26, 28 years ago, and uh, it's been very active. It's not a big organization. Uh, what it stands for is the restoration of existing urban centers and towns and uh, real communities in real neighborhoods and diverse districts. Basically, it's walkable communities and trying to make beautiful places. And it is an organization not of certain professionals. It includes engineers, planners, architects, activists, real estate agents, financial people, but they're all aimed at making walkable, beautiful neighborhoods and cities. And I think it's been remarkably effective. And I'll give you a list of some of the uh, changes and movements we've made, and I'm not bragging when I give you this list that's all verifiable from secondary sources, but it sounds like we're bragging. Um, we actually, some of us influenced the design of new cities in China. One of our group went there. Uh, there's a center for incremental development. Since maybe big projects aren't possible, we do some incremental development. There's tactical urbanism. Urban street standards from the Institute for Traffic Engineers were instituted. Lead for neighborhoods development. We had a big hand in that. We had to work to reform federal housing finance to include mixed use buildings because it used to be a, you couldn't use federal funds for mixed use. Uh, we have a bunch of sprawl retrofit ideas. The HUD home program was influenced by our group. There's something called lean urbanism. Um, investment ready places, I think that's in Michigan. Um, there's some people who figure out what's the revenue versus cost of urban places versus big box. Uh, Foreign-based codes actually started those. Street diets, 
traditional neighborhood design, street network design, missing middle housing, city friendly erosion response standards, and urban to rural design standards. So those are some of the things uh, we are we have accomplished, and we will be working more in the future. Um, so what is the connection between this and sewer systems? Well, uh, the sewer system will make possible more compact development, smaller lots, uh, better streets, better street network, and um, as shown in Robert's design here. And the idea of um, neighborhoods is very old. So this is uh, June 1948, I think, uh, by Clarence Stein, a famous uh, architect, and we used the uh, city planner and used the idea of the neighborhood as a unit of development. And um, it was a walkable half mile uh, radius in the and the uh, school or village center was at the center with more dense housing and less uh, dense housing towards the edge. And this is an example of the most recent adapted diagram that uh, New Rivers came up with. And what we're trying to avoid is this, which is almost anywhere in the United States where you have people living on septic systems, but individual ones. And we're trying to get closer to this, which is an actual urbanist design new village in uh, Canada. So my name is Robert Folks. I'm a land use planner. Um, I put the group together that uh, created the new neighborhood. Of, I think there was eight of us at the beginning. Um, uh, I'm 67 years old, and my interest is doing the new neighborhood was to preserve forests. And my idea was that the land of this area is predominantly forest, even though people think of it as cherry orchards, but there's more forests than orchards. Um, and the forests were being chopped up and made into subdivisions. And people would, in my opinion, have a better life if they lived in a community and then went walking in a forest instead of removing the forest and then having nowhere to walk. Um, so that was my interest. I knew the, the I, I own a farm near Sutton's Bay, um, and I knew the communities, and my firm that I'm a partner in, SMAP in Chicago, uh, was hired by the Village of Empire about 30 years ago to work on streetscape. So I was hired and paid to look at Empire and understand Empire. And I asked questions like, how much does a house cost in Empire? And they said, I don't know. And I said, well, give me the, the listing price of three houses for sale in Empire. They said, there aren't three houses for sale. And I said, well, how does a house change hands? And they said, well, people just go to the funeral <laughs> and <laughs> get the house. But that's changed, as you know. Um, but we did look at the community and what was happening or what wasn't happening, and we came back with recommendations. Um, and some things happened, those recommendations, some didn't. Uh, but from then on, the village clerk would send every developer who came to Empire to me instead of having to, to deal with them directly. Um, and one wanted to build a factory on the, the property where the new neighborhood is now located. And I said that the, it's not zoned for that, and I said that there's an empty factory down the street, why don't you go look at that? And they ended up at that location. And then the property was available. Uh, could you stand by the one that's that work for you? Uh, I can. So, is that better? Yeah, they can record it. Record better. it better? Okay. Um, so then the new neighborhood was there to, to be done, and uh, this is where I begin to thank everybody who made this happen. Mark Wyckoff wrote the zoning, and without that, it never would have happened. And he wrote a very clever zoning that said, you've got a nice town, continue it. 
It's a little longer than that, but that's the basis of it. Um, there's a technical problem with continuing the town in that now the requirement for single septic systems also had a reserve field, and so we, were, we had a space issue. And then I knocked on all the doors of all the engineering firms around, and I came to Gordy Fraser. And I want to thank them. There's a whole lot of them to thank, but I don't know where they are at the moment. But Harry Lucius was the guy that worked on the, the community septic system. And, uh, and they've all worked on it over many years uh, in various capacities. And they were up for it, where every other engineering firm I contacted would blow off the idea that we had and say, well, just do it this way. <laughs> Whack in a bunch of half as many houses and twice as fast and, and get out of there. Um, my interest is in uh, slow money and slow capitalism. I think keeping, and, and it's also in use value instead of exchange value. My hope is that people make use of, of their community and each other and the good things and share them. So that was, that was all of our, uh, the partner's idea. But it didn't go over with, with a lot of engineers and a lot of different people. Um, but we did find a team that, would, that could make it happen. And the, the last one was uh, Cal Excavating of uh, Omina. They were willing to do all the goofy little things that we wanted to do instead of one great big, you know, great big roads and done quick. So we assembled a team. We uh, put our money in a, in a pot. We paid ourselves to design the neighborhood. We came back to the village and then found that the village didn't actually understand their own zoning. And so that was a a learning curve for the village. Uh, they got through the learning curve with the help of their uh, village attorney who said, this is what your zoning says. Do this. Um, in that time of planning, we looked very closely at the property. The property looks like a square, um, but it's really not a square. It's three-dimensional and it's got uh, topography, the b bottom right corner is the southeast corner is the highest point and it goes downhill diagonally northwest to the bottom of the Nipissing Ridge. Do people know what the Nipissing Ridge is? Anybody? One guy does because I told him already this morning. Um, uh, a long time ago Lake Michigan was 20 feet deeper and at that time it had a beach and then it receded and now we have the lake that we have now, but the beach remains. And if you drive in Chicago on Clark Street, you're driving on top of the Nipissing Ridge. And if you're in Empire and you go down Michigan Street, you rise up over the, Mich the Nipissing Ridge before you get to Lake Street. So it wanders around all the way around Lake Michigan wherever there's topography appropriate to, for it to exist. Um, anyway, we, I, let's put it that way, think it's a valuable physical asset. It's, so we cut off, there's only one diagonal road in the new neighborhood, that's the alley in phase one, and that's so that we don't cut into the Nipissing Ridge. Um, so we looked at the property about how water flows underneath it, about how water would flow on top of it, about where uh, physical changes were that were of interest. And then we dug 36 holes and looked at the soils. And we brought out the health department. And that's another entity that we have to thank, which is Clay McNitt. You couldn't have a better name for somebody who tests your soil in a health department. Um, he came around, he looked at every one of those 36 holes, and we talked about where would be the best places to put septic fields. And then we put them there, and he about fell over because we did something that they actually asked for, which is not.
typical. Um, so that became the open spaces that are in the new neighborhood, and then we filled in around that with the housing. And we continued the grid of the old town with, with uh, Wilts and Michigan. Only that map isn't accurate. That map shows straight lines, but Michigan and Wilts aren't straight. I think the surveyors were having a, a drinking session when they surveyed. <laughs> it's, uh, it, it widens out 13 feet across from Lake Street to, to LaCour. So we bent it back to straight uh, when we crossed the street. Uh, so we have a design, we have a planning thing, and in the planning, Mark Wyckoff said it should be done in phases, which was also intelligent. Um, this is a small town. If you build that much town at one time, you very much disrupt the community. So doing it slowly, this is, this is a note for every official here, every development should be done slowly, unless it's a tiny, tiny effort. Um, it should be uh, add on to the community a little at a time. Uh, so we did it in phases. Phases started at the north and went south. Um, and we required that, that houses be built within begun within two years so that we get complete uh, community. Uh, the system's technical system is that it's a septic field. It's just a big one. Um, we, the tanks are, are at each uh, lot uh, to collect the solids. We have, uh, we require that risers be there at, at surface so that they can be maintained and we require that they be inspected annually. Not pumped annually, just inspected. You can inspect it for $25. To pump it, it's $300. If, if you are careful with your system, you don't need to pump it for 10 years. But everybody else on a private system never has it tested. They just have it pumped, whether it needs it or not. So that's why people don't do it. Um, also, with it tested every year, we found the classic thing that's happening now, which is brand new systems are failing. And so we found failing systems. And I can tell you who makes failing systems, but that'll be after the, the show. Um, but, uh, but with finding them, we got them fixed. Go ahead. When you say systems, you're just talking about tanks, aren't you? Just the tanks. Yeah. Yeah, but any tank, any place can fail. Um, so having an inspection in some kind of logical length of time is worthwhile. Uh, the village of Empire has, a, you only inspect when you sell your house. Um, nowadays. Go ahead. First of all, village of Empire is ahead of most people because at least it's inspected when you sell the house. But um, what does a failing tank do? I mean, what's, how, how can a tank fail? Uh, you it, have to speak a little louder to take that off. How does a tank fail? A tank can fail simply by leaking. By leaking. And tanks are usually cast concrete in two halves and joined and sealed together. And if you're not, uh, if you're in a big hurry and you're incompetent, you don't seal it well. Okay. And then it leaks and it, if you come to pump or inspect, mostly inspect, you'll find that the, the, the water only rises halfway up, which is not correct. It's supposed to rise all the way in the one side and flow over into the other side. Um, so with it failing, you, your effluent doesn't get to, to your septic field. It just pours out around your tank next to your house. How nice. Um, so that's... But, but they can fail in all kinds of ways. They can fail because somebody drove over a pipe that was laid and, and they cracked the pipe. They could, all kinds of things. But inspecting finds failures and then you fix them. Not inspecting, no, no find, no fix. So uh, the systems, let's take phase one, 15 lots, 15 tanks at, at homes. They, that collects the solid, sends out the, the liquid, 
it all goes gravity, and this is where Harry was so uh, incredibly good, designing and working, and he was the guy who started it, meaning he was, other people didn't get to say, I want this here, that there, he, he laid out how it would work, then you could build back from what he laid out. Um, uh, so the system's all gravity to a further set of collection tanks, and he said you can put two tanks in and run the system. Or you can put three tanks in and really have a good system. So it filters, filters, and then the last chamber is not a filter chamber, it's a pump chamber. And the pump chamber just rises up to a certain level, has a certain amount of gallons, and turns on the pump with a simple, just like a toilet, only reversed. Um, and then pumps out to half the field, using all of the field. So let's go back to everybody else's field, almost everyone. It's gravity, it goes out in the field, you flush your toilet, that, that amount of water goes into your field, exactly. And that's all it does. And so it only goes to the first 10 feet of your field and never uses the whole field and clogs up at, at the front end. So this system sends it all the way in on half the field and then, however much time later, turns on a second pump and runs it all the way to fill the other half of the field. So it's a long time before it's used again. And that's a good way to run a septic system. Um, so, uh, the other thing that, that has happened over many years, and Chris Fry has collected a lot of data about it, um, is how much people use it. Uh, we have data on water use because we have water meters, we have a water system, we have a great system in this village. It is not a, a modern system, it is a bunch of wells with some pipes connected. We're living and drinking fresh water straight from the ground, no treatment. So we want to keep it uh, clean. So uh, uh, where was I? Uh, Chris uh, collected the data. We uh, collect the, the gallon data for the system, how much it pumps, because the pumps have a little meter on them. Um, and we can look over time at how much the systems are being used. Uh, I think Barry will talk about uh, capacity of systems and all that. These systems are designed for about 6,000 gallons a day, and they're running at, uh, on average, less than 50%. You don't want to get to 100%, but um, they're well below for the complete systems. And so it's good long-term data to look at. Um, other things in modern life have decreased the amount of water that, that households use. So modern Americans actually use less water gallons per day than 1960s Americans. Um, uh, so that's good. Um, uh, what else do you want to know? This, go ahead. Early on, you said that this was an expansion of the village. Can you give us some numbers just so we get? I'm not familiar with Empire. Was it a 40% increase in the number of housing units? Uh, I think it was about a 20% increase in the number of housing units. An interesting thing is that the census data tells us that the new neighborhood only kept Empire exactly at the same population because that's the permanent population, that's the census population, not the summer population. So uh, there's a lot of people who live year-round in the new neighborhood, and there are a number of houses that in my time here, 30 years or so, I've seen a lot of older families sell out and it becomes a summer residence. So the population dropped in, in this side of town and went up in that side of town, but in, the, in total census, population stayed the same. Um, obviously, the summer population is growing because there's more houses and people are using them for that use. Uh, so, uh, one of the things that was very interesting in the process of designing this and putting it out to the village was, what's the density? 
and we had, I had many meetings in this room, and I had many people saying, I would never live in a place so crowded, so this, so that, so negative. And I said, you live in, I knew where they lived, they lived in a, on a lot exactly the same size as what we were proposing. But on paper, it looked much denser. Do you have data on the summer population? Is no. That, is that kept? I don't think there is data on the summer population. I don't know how to collect it. Um, uh, we don't have data on septic failures either. That's at, that's, that's at that park headquarters. That's, they don't all stay in Empire, I can guarantee you that. <laughs> um, but they're around here, and, and I think we're foolish to have them not stay a little longer and to, and to enjoy the place a bit, but to walk as much as possible. We now have a bike trail, which is wonderful, um, but uh, we could do all kinds of other things. We have a shore to shore trail that goes all the way across the state that's hardly, hardly known to people. It goes right in front of your property. Um, but that's, um, all of those things are, are worth, uh, m more people would, would enjoy the place and the people who live here would continue to enjoy it if we had those kind of uses. Is that a short, short trail the horses? That yeah, it's primarily a horse. People use it, for, but you can walk it. A friend of mine walked from Lake Michigan to Lake Huron. It took him a little while, um, but he did it. Um, to answer your question uh, about populations, I, it, yeah, the, when I looked at the 2010 census, um, Empire had roughly 400 households, and those are both seasonal and, and non-seasonal. So this added about 60 lots against a 400 household base. Um, the way to figure out seasonal housing, it's not easily done. Um, I, I did it once. Um, you get the entire tax base, parcel tax base, from the county. You isolate out vacant land. And then you can isolate out homestead versus non-homestead. Everybody's from Michigan, so you know those terms. So if you look at non-homestead, as a surrogate for seasonal second home ownership. Um, we were, when I looked at it five years ago, six years ago, we were 50% in climbing. And very typical of communities like, like Northern, very typical of communities of our circumstance. And the reason I was asking, I mean, part of it, my perspective is I come from Ann Arbor, and. Some of you might have heard that there's sort of seasonal people come and go for different events in that town. I'm not sure why. And, um, and, and we're now seeing a lot of people building, purposefully building whole buildings that are designed for Airbnb. So they're pushing yes. back with zoning that says you can't rent it for less than 30 days, back and forth and back and forth. So they're tracking, they're trying to track that seasonal influx. Um, and I've also worked in places that are seasonal, but the other season, where you go there for the winter, and then the implications on the septic field are different because the septic field gets taxed mostly at Christmas time. Mm -hmm. And so those communities are kind of interesting because they're ski communities, and they um, they get all their failures in the middle of winter. Right. Well, and, and, and there's been, pardon me, Robert. Go ahead. Uh, the, there's been concern, I mean, we have Airbnbs in the new neighborhood. I, I personally don't like them, but it's, a, it's, a, it's, it's short-term rentals, Airbnbs, that's a whole another day-long seminar, so we won't go there. But um, um, com concern has been expressed that, oh, you know, it's, it's crowded for a week with, you know, four, per, four people per bedroom in the house, so there's, there's 12 people in a three-bedroom house. Because of the way Robert Quirker Salva and all the stakeholders developed the system, that's just a blip. It's not going to cause any dramatic impact on a system which is pooling together wastewater from 15, 20 homes um, 
it's it, that's a minor impact, and, and, and luckily, because of the way, thanks to, to Corpus Alba, who it's done, designed, that actually mitigates though that, that that particular concern. Yeah, and I see that. That's why I was asking about yeah. it. Yeah, yeah. But most of the area doesn't have this system. Correct. So we've got houses that are over occupied for yes. their systems, yes. Yes. and there's no uh, health effort to uh, regulation to, to say you're going to run this type of system we have to, you have to prove that it'll that it'll handle that capacity yeah and, and 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 on the older in the older neighborhoods where way before any way way before public health acts of the state of Michigan when these neighborhoods were developed with the smaller lots you, you you put in a tank you but you typically put in a drywall you didn't even put in a drain field because drain field technology hadn't been invented here. Drain field technology really became effective with the invention of perforated PVC pipe in the 1970s. Um, the drain fields are relatively small, even ones that now have drain fields. People put garages, everything else. So when the drain fields fail, which they do about two or three a year in the older part of the town, um, the health department is needs to put something in and prescribe something, but to Robert's point, they're physically constrained and probably don't necessarily meet the size standards of the current regulatory environment. Um, but the health department can't literally shut down a house and they're loath to put a house on holding tanks. So they, they kind of adjust and they have some regulatory wriggle room and they will, they will do what they can do um, for a failed system on a small lot in the core village. And a new system is far better than a failed system, so. Yeah, yeah, but the, but the big issue long term all over Michigan, northern Michigan, small town Michigan, is failing systems that we don't know are failing. And, and very often it's people who don't have a lot of money to fix them. Uh, I've been a builder for 45 years. I have dug up a 1938 Chevy that was septic, just a pipe through the window. Um, I don't think that's approved anymore. Um, maybe a 47 Chevy, but anyway, people did all kinds of things. Nobody was looking. It worked for them at the time, um, but uh, uh, systems fail a lot. And new ones fail a tremendous amount. New systems fail at a very high rate because they're not put in carefully. Um, every, everybody's in, in a big hurry to get in, get the tank in, get out. Uh, they don't compact the soils correctly. Um, Stanford University had a big disaster with the septic field. It's a great story and it's a great picture. You can see the tank lifting out of the ground. Um, at Stanford, a place with a lot of money, um, but it was it was improperly installed and it failed immediately. And they would they only know that it failed because it came all the way out of the ground. Um, but broken pipes, all kinds of things, all this stuff is is uh, you have to pay a little more to do it right. And and most people want to pay less, and so they get the guy. Who, puts it in for less, and, and it works the day le left, and nobody looks back. So that's uh, something to, to keep in mind. Um, the, the, the thing where we have a point of sale thing with the Village of Empire is good, but it's not good enough. Um, we really should go to something where, where it gets uh, an inspection. If we had an inspection thing that was $25, to inspect, it would, people wouldn't be put off by that. But they're put off by paying the $300 to pump if they don't have to. Um, and they think they don't have to until the system backs up. Um, OK, so uh, I'm trying to thank all the people who made this happen. Uh, and i got to remember all of them. Jennifer is here somewhere. There she is. Me. <laughs> you. Um, uh, Engineers who will take the time 
to do what what we need to do is is uh, they're hard to come by, um, and and to think a little forward and again take the time. They really did uh, do a lot of things over a long period of time uh, and stayed with it. Um, and they, as far as I know, still do some of the inspecting. Um, but that's there's a great need for that job to expand all over the place where things get inspected, not pumped, inspected. Does it work? Um, let me go over one more technical thing with the new neighborhood septic fields, and all new fields should have this. At the far end of every field is a valve, and you can open the valve and you can flush the system. You can clean it. You can fix it. That's a valve. It's a little plastic valve. It is not expensive. That, but it requires at the front end that you be able to access and push fresh water through and flush the field. So uh, it's a little more complicated than just the end valves, but it's really worthwhile. And new systems should all have it. Um, they're not required at the moment. Um, pumping, as I said, is, is, is to me more appropriate now than, than gravity. Into, the, into a system. I think you could do a gravity system with an extra tank that would have that, that valve and would turn on and send a significant amount into the field, which would be better than the dribble that happens now. Um, so that's worthwhile. Um, the other thing that's worthwhile that happens in the new neighborhood, used to happen, might still be happening, is that people come out and look when the inspector is there. People inform each other, the inspection will be on this date. And everybody, I've, I've been there when there was a circle of people standing around as they opened up the tank and the guy looked down in and said, well, looks fine, oh, looks bad, whatever. Um, we've had one failure in the new neighborhood of a piece of equipment. Um, the, the pumps that move the, the effluent into the field hang inside the tanks, the final tank. They hang on a, on a hanger. Um, and one jumped off a hanger and fell to the bottom and broke. And that's the only failure we've had in 25 years. Um, we are getting to an age when other things will fail, meaning the pumps that have run for 20 years will fail. And, and I recommend that uh, people switch them out before they fail. Um, but those are the most expensive single things in the whole system. But putting the system in correctly so that we didn't get kinks in the pipes and we didn't get other things, that's really critical at the beginning. And, and we have uh, a good contractor to do it and we have inspectors along the way watching how well they did it. Um, so any other questions? My wife has a question. Sorry. And I wish my memory was better about this. What was the price of that one pump you had to replace? It was something like eight hundred dollars. Eight hundred dollars. Yeah, it's not a big deal. It's just an important part. I think huh? eight hundred dollars is a big deal, but well, <laughs> for a group of fifteen, fifteen pounds. Yeah. Yeah. There's two pumps in every system, so there's sixteen hundred dollars worth of pumps in in each system, um, and and they only work one side, and the other one works the other side. Um, there's another way to do it, but it's complicated with a valve that flips back and forth, and then you only have one pump. So if that one goes, you've got nothing going. Um, but uh, the two pump system is what, how we've done it. Um, the, let me go back to the land. This is, uh, you know, the map isn't correct. It says Lake Michigan is out there. Lake Michigan is actually underneath all of this. It's water down right where that, that height is for Lake Michigan continues under all of the village and all of the new neighborhood and all that hill. And it's slightly elevated. And it's moving into Lake Michigan. Do we all know that? Yeah. That's. That's the reality. That's groundwater, 
And that's really nice stuff, and we should not pollute it. Okay, and so people should know where it is and which way it's going and if it's in good condition. And in the village of Empire, we have test wells. And we test the water once in a while. And that's required only because we have a water system. But everybody else all over this county who lives out in the country, I'm looking at one right now, has a well but they are not required to test their water. But we do test it. So we know if, if we had a problem at, in the groundwater, we'd know it. But all over the rest of northern Michigan, we don't know it. Benton Harbor, they know it, but other places, they just haven't looked. So it's worthwhile to look. The village does a wonderful job checking on things with a scattering of test wells to take a sample every once in a while, see how things are going. And in those sample wells, they also see the movement of height. So we've had high water in Lake Michigan, and that backs up to high water in the ground water. So that's it backs up to water in certain people's basements in, in the village. So, we, but we looked at that. We looked at where the groundwater was. We looked at, there are lenses of, of water that sit on clay here and there that are up higher. Um, we know where they are. Um, and uh, everything that we looked at, we spent about a year getting ready with the plan, and, uh, and we ticked off the boxes that we knew, yeah, we could do it. Yeah, we could do it. Yeah, we could do it. Um, we came up with a density of 126 dwelling units. That's based all the way back and completely on the DEQ at the time, Eagle now, um, uh, capacity of the fields that we designed. The legal amount of dwelling units, I think, was about 150, according to the zoning. So we put in less development than we could have under zoning, but we did it under, you know, the, the limiting factor was the septic capacity. Uh, legal septic capacity, not real septic capacity. Uh, so, but it was important to us to have density and to have uh, housing close enough that people could actually meet each other and know each other, but not so close that they were on top of each other. Uh, Manhattan has got a density of uh, uh, 220 an acre. Um, this has 17 an acre. Allowable density, not really, you know, that flexes because how many people live in a house is, is up to them. But in, in a general idea, and Manhattan is, is a place where people don't know each other. Um, uh, and and neighborhoods are places where people do know each other. And that's, that's a wonderful thing, assuming you've got some good neighbors. But my assumption is that everybody's got something good about them. Um, so that density, I think, is, is appropriate and helpful for people to interact, and uh, not just at a town meeting, but, but on a daily basis. We did a, a porch bonus in the new neighborhood. That was a, a interesting thing to work through with the village. There was setbacks from the 60s in, in the village ordinance. You had to be 40 feet back on your property before you began to build your house. This is when we uh, began the new neighborhood. But because it was a PUD, we could propose something different. So we said it should be at 20 feet and that that should be the line of the, of the uh, uh, Four Season building, and that in the next 10 feet, you could have a porch. And that is on the public street. And so people interact with each other on the street, and that really is a room. Uh, and people can, in effect, snoop on each other because you can see what's on their porch. Um, so you get all this interaction with porches. I like porches a lot. I think they're practical.
there a, a three season space, depends on how hardy you are, maybe a two season space, but, um, but they're, they're positive. And uh, in the time that we were building this, I was teaching architecture for two years and I had all kinds of students come up and help build porches. Um, students from Romania, students from Costa Rica, students from, I now get uh, students from Ireland. Um, but these are, they're coming from places where they don't have porches. Um, and so they're, they're fascinated by it. But we, this is, a, this is an area that porches make sense. So we put them there. Uh, uh, I'm getting off from the septic, but, but all these things uh, uh, made it happen and made it happen well. We put alleys in so that we would put cars in the back. We want it to be a walkable community. And if you have to walk by driveways where they're backing out in a big hurry to go get their gallon of milk and they run over your dog, um, it's not a great place. So we put in alleys, which is, which is the pattern of the village. Um, and a lot of the septics go out the back. Uh, so we have, we have another option. That's, that's a big plus of the old style of streets and alleys. You have more options of where to run systems. Um, conventional subdivisions, there's only one place to, to go, and that's out to the road. So uh, the grid system is very good. This is a grid system that we kept, but we kept it for, for walking. We didn't keep it for everything. We don't have lots of ways to get by car into um, the downtown. Uh, Chris Fry came, built his home, and then did the connection from, uh, or got the village to do the connection uh, along Wills, a, uh, a sidewalk connection. Uh, I hope someday there's a similar thing on Michigan. Um, but just pedestrian, not cars. If you, if you design so it's easier to walk than to drive, people will walk. If you design where it's easier to drive, people will drive. Right until they crash. Um, so the septic systems work. They need people to occupy them. So having a requirement to build in a phase, I think, is a very good thing. People don't like paying for a system that they don't use. Um, the typical developer doesn't put in anything. He sells the, the lot and the house and the septic field when he builds it, um, or he sells a lot and he doesn't have to do anything. Um, but, uh, but if you do this type of system, you want it to get used and paid for. Uh, anything else? Any other questions? I've got 15 minutes. I can do a lot of questions. Go ahead, Mark. Will there be any uh, uh, sense to uh, laying out the entire state of Michigan with a traditional street grid, allowing no. for <laughs> natural habitat and agricultural, or public land and agricultural use um, as kind of a radical suggestion for the future? I think we can go to every existing village, every place that we've already got laid out. Actually, all over northern Michigan, there are many, many laid out, platted out places that never happened, never happened at all. Um, up near Northport, there's this huge area of tiny little lots that it's just a woods. Um, but adjoining existing villages, it would be worthwhile to, to lay out, and not just existing, Traverse City. The, the, the spread of Traverse City out into the countryside could be um, millerated, ameliorated uh, greatly by some planning like that. Uh, it, it doesn't tend to happen. The way we did it is, is not going to be a norm. Um, I think the way that uh, the village of Bel Air did it, where they purchased a piece of property, hired a plan to be done, and then sold the property with the plan saying, this is what we want. Zoning, the way we practice it in the US, is really a, a, a negative. 
it says what you can do, but what it really means is we don't want you to do these other things. But it leaves you open to do all kinds of stuff and every, and you can build bad in any zoning category. So um, if, if you want to re replicate this, I think the best, most logical thing is for uh, either a group to get together, buy a piece of land and go forward with it. But really, this happened before we came along because Mark Wyckoff was hired by the village, by the planning commission, to, to write the PUD that is the new neighborhood. And that's, and I read that and I said, we could do this. If they, if they want this, if they're, but I was wrong. They didn't want it because they didn't understand it. They approved it, they said yes, but they approved it as, as, as a reaction to a negative. It was all zone commercial at one time. That's 30 acres. Now how big is the commercial area of Empire? 11 acres. So you don't need 30 more, and 11 underutilized acres. You didn't need 30 more acres of commercial, and you didn't need it there. So that was, that was an improvement, and it was work by citizens who made it happen. And I don't even, I, I'm thanking them now, but I don't know their names. Go ahead. I'm, I'm, I'm not a planner, so I don't follow you as accurately as maybe I should. You said you followed zoning to do this, but yet I thought I, thought you, I heard you say zoning is a problem all around northern Michigan. Are you saying don't? Do, don't use zoning to do this, better development? This unique little village hired somebody and made it happen, made a good zoning pattern happen. They had zoning, they had, they had a pattern that was old, which is what the, the Center for uh, CNU is all about. Beautiful, good patterns. Um, they have a pattern, you can see the village. It was laid out, and it was before cars. So it was laid out for horses and for walking. Um, but it, that's the pattern. People live with it. That pattern is essentially 50 by 100. That's the size of the footprints. Um, Chicago has, is 25 by 120. Not always, but, but mostly 25. I've worked on a house in Baltimore that was on a 12-foot wide lot. There's all kinds of different patterns, but this 50-foot pattern is what existed in the village. It has a feel, it has a look, and I think Sutton's Bay is 60 feet wide. But everything's a little different, but they work in certain ways. But if you get too big, you don't walk. It's too far to walk to, to the things that you're interested in. Um, Two rather than the same, just so that I think I heard a question and I may have heard the answer, but others might have the same question. This gentleman, Wyckoff, I for, sorry, I forgot his first name. Mark. Mark. He laid out the PUD based on the existing town's pattern, kind of independent, because he was asked to and he did what I'm going to call the right thing. Right. Now, the PUD is a very strict control of whatever it's written to. It controls that land very strictly, not according to the rest of the zone, right. necessarily. And because it got adap adopted by the Planning Commission, you could come in and make sure it happened physically because Mark Wyckoff laid out a very good pattern for you to work with. <coughs> Am I understanding that right? Mark Wyckoff said you already have a very good pattern, right. use it. Use it again. And yes. He wrote the PUD that way. And he said that in the PUD. I'm paraphrasing. So the, the clarity that I would offer to that is, just like you said, zoning can be done poorly. PUDs can be written poorly. There's no guarantee there. Right. Which goes to what Robin was saying, <coughs> because she was hearing you say both zoning can be bad and, in fact, you follow good zoning. Only because it was written well. Only because it was there. Um, we, with the PUD, we influenced the village to get rid of a bad zoning detail, which was a 60, 40-foot setback. 
they got rid of that. They said, oh, this, it was, I don't know why it was there. It was there. Um, so they've gotten rid of that. They've thought more about how close uh, buildings are to each other, and I think they've narrowed the uh, set, side setbacks in, in the old part of town. So there's been all kinds of stuff that has happened because this group uh, looks at it, and they have something small enough to understand and to take care of, which is really wonderful. And, and by accident, Empire has what, what are called urban growth boundaries. It can't grow. It's got a national park on north and south. It's got a lake on, on the west. And the land uses are pretty much locked up to the east. It's, it's the footprint that it is. It doesn't have the problem that Traverse City does, which is shh, you don't know where it's going to end. Um, and you have different uh, political jurisdictions to arm wrestle with. So, but a lot of places, so this place has all kinds of pluses that made it happen. A lot of people made it happen. And, and intelligent engineers figured out a system that could work with the old pattern of the 50 foot lots better than the current way that we do it. And, and let me say, the last thing is that it's cheaper than the current way we do it. 20 houses with one septic system that costs 30 some thousand is cheaper than 20 separate septic systems. And better. And better. But cheaper is the one that people really like. <laughs> um, go ahead. Um, having done just a smattering, a little bit of development work myself. Um, it's also important, I think, to commend Quercus Alva and this gentleman, Wyckoff, I've not, never met. Um, you know, Michigan's kind of funny because, as I understand it, these PUDs, these PUDs are actually a, a, a governmental regulation. It's part of the zoning of the village. It's enforceable by the village. It's enforceable by the zoning administrator of the village because it is part of the, of the village's zoning. In our case, in our PUD, where the PUD is silent on a subject, it defaults to then the village balance of its zoning ordinance for clarity, if there is any clarity, on a particular matter, what the PUD doesn't know. In other cases in development in Michigan, what's most popular, quite frankly, that I've seen in northern Michigan is this phenomenon called site condominiums. Everybody heard of those? Anybody heard of those before? They're really funky. They're it's a it's it's a kind of it's it's like a subdivision, but it's a private association, and it writes its own rules, but it has no enforceability by the municipal entities. They are recorded instruments against a deed, but there's no enforceability delegated, as I understand it, with these. But the site condominiums become very inexpensive to develop. It's really easy to punch in a row, split it into five lots that looks like, smells like, tastes like, acts like a subdivision, but it ain't a subdivision. It's this legal phenomenon called a site condominium. And the village doesn't have to have anything to do with it other than blessing it at its, at its inception. Um, doesn't enforce it later doesn't own any of the infrastructure inside of it, so it's a savings to the village. Ah, we don't have to snow plow it. We don't have to worry about reserving for the road. It puts all the burden. So it's, it's, so I really, what's, what's beautiful about the new neighborhood was the added expense and effort to make it a PUD. And we have a couple other PUDs in the village. And the village has been very good about that over the years. But the site condominiums, and because the site condominiums, they can kind of fall and be developed and kind of turn into not a walkable neighborhood, not have all the features that this has, and just kind of be ugly things put into vacant land and farm fields and forests. And it, it's, it's a cheap way to subdivide with often very little planning involvement on the front end. So. Back, back here. I'd like to follow up to that comment. 
Yes, correct. Provided that the municipality allows the developers to add all those conditions to the site condo. Site condominiums are forms of ownership. A municipality could require a site condominium to have no rules and restrictions in their master deeds if they wanted to. Right. But the private market, because it's, it, it came out of condominiumization, has attached so many uh, covenants, codes, and restrictions in condominiums. So you could do a site condominium, or you could require as a municipality a site condominiums to comply in all respects with zoning and other uses in your village, including plan new developments. Yes, you could. The issue is that municipalities don't know that, and they don't do it. And they don't do it. And it's a one and done. Go ahead. Uh, can you give examples of, of local site condominium places here? If you, there is a good chance if you go out M72 and a lot of the private drives that are off of M72, there's several of them on your way to Shimmick's Corners, speaking too locally, many of them may well be site condominiums. I don't have any ownership in them, so I haven't investigated them, but they may well be because they have a shared driveway and um, Northport has a, Northport Heights is a site condominium. In, in, in structure up in Northport because I did a development next to it. Um, but you can make site, site condominiums good, to your point. But they often, it's, 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 it's cheap, it's an inexpensive way to do land division. They don't divide. <laughs> they don't. That's, the, the other one that happens is that they do an overlay of their own zoning. So there's, I know that there are places here out in the countryside where they say you can own this 10 acre beautiful spot with your house, but you cannot farm. And it's in ag district. So they've undone the zoning. You, you now have a private restriction on that piece of property that says you're out, no farming here ever. Um, it happens a lot. Is this county? Oh, yeah. Yeah, because they want to make executive estates, and executives don't have to farm. Um, so that, those things, uh, we did the new neighborhood as much as possible in the pattern of the, the old part of the village. And the old part of the village has fee simple lots. You buy a lot, you own the property, and, and, and you are subject to the, the village as your community who decides limits and, and all those things. We wanted the same setup in the new neighborhood. I was told, you don't want to do that, it'll take you years to get uh, Fee Simple Lots approved. And I looked at what it took to get Fee Simple Lots approved, and, and if you did it the normal way, it takes years. I happen to have a very nice motorcycle, and I go really fast on it, and I went to all the different places that I had to get all the approvals, and I had a very thick book, a biography of Lyndon Johnson by Robert Caro. And I said, I'm here, I need this sign, and I'm not leaving until you sign it. And I got what people told me will take six, two years, I got it in six weeks. I got six different uh, public entities to sign off um, in the sequence that had to be done. There's a logic to the sequence. Um, but there's no logic that each one of them has to sit on it for three months. And, and I got that book read. Um, so um, I, don't, I don't know that you have to do fee simple lots every place, but I think it's a very good pattern for a village. So I recommend it that, that the planning commission look at and, and require if things, if large parcels are going to be chopped up, that they be made into fee simple lots so that people have a relationship with each other that's comparable. Not, oh, we're in this group and our gate is closed and we're not going to talk to you other people. So um, that can happen with certain, uh, it doesn't necessarily happen in the site county, but it can happen. And, and for them to set their own rules for certain things I think is inappropriate. I don't think that they should they should be able to undo the, the zoning that the community has set for properties. 
Uh, any other questions? It's my time is up. One more. Just a little bit, a little bit off topic, but I was interested in the uh, comments earlier about the new neighborhood helping to stabilize the population here in the village. And uh, I noticed in the census, uh, 2020 census, Empire Township was down 5% in population, I believe. I'm just wondering if people here have any uh, insight on, you know, what that means in terms of uh, short-term rentals or, or uh, development in the countryside or, or what? It, it really means that, that housing is, is uh, people who want to live, who need a place to live and they work, are being outbid by people who have way more money or, or have a business plan that's, that makes that housing unaffordable for, for regular occupation. That's it. And that's happening everywhere. Everywhere that people want to go. Benton Harbor, you can get a good rental. <laughs>